Morning, everybody. Oh, good afternoon. <laughs> Seriously, it's been one of those days. Got home from work, no time for tea, basically in the car, here, and then off to Sam's afterwards to get some signatures. Anyway, hello, that's safe. Great to see you all here, good turnout. Don't know if it's Dan or if it's the 7.30 time slot. I guess we'll see as the year goes on, or maybe because it's the first um, Bible class of the year. But uh, as you can see on the screen behind me, um, Dan's title tonight is The City of God, and that's based on Revelation chapter 21. So uh, we, our opening hymn is actually 94, not 95. That was a uh, typo on the board. <clears throat> and so if you just turn back one page, um, we'll commence our meeting with hymn 94 followed by prayer.
<laughs> Yahweh our Father, we come to you as words of praise that we, we sing and we know to be true of your wonder and your glory. And while we see it in some form in the world around us through the things you've made for us to enjoy, nature, the food, your creation, the, the skies and the stars above us, uh, it's, it's certainly missing from many areas in which the way the world operates. But we come together tonight to be encouraged as we read through and continue through this study of Revelation because the hope at the end of that is a revitalised world where everywhere we look we'll see change and we'll see you in the way people deal with each other, in the way worship is conducted <coughs> and still continuing in a refreshed global environment. So as we spend this time together tonight, please be with us, we ask, and help us to be encouraged. Please be with Dan and Rosemary in, in, their, in their responsibilities and we open our meeting then through this hymn and prayer, through your son Jesus Christ, amen. <clears throat> Okay, so the, uh, the basis for the talk uh, is uh, Revelation 21, which I will um, read for you. Uh, I'll be reading from the New King James tonight. Uh, and then after I've finished, Dan, if you'd like to just come straight up, mate, and, uh, and we'll start. Uh, we'd love to hear what you've got to say. <clears throat> okay, Revelation 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eye. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, uh, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. <coughs> Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she also had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and twelve angels at the gates with names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. 
Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chalcedony, and the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophase, and the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was, of, was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And all the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honour into it. Its gates shall not be shut all by day. Uh, its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honour of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter, into, uh, enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. <clears throat> Thanks, Ben. And uh, also, uh, as Ben said, thank you, Sister Rosemary. Uh, that was a prescient choice of him. Absolutely perfect. Great Father of glory, pure Father of light, your angels adore thee, unveiled is their sight. Um, and uh, that's kind of a, a really good forecasting of where we want to go this evening together. So uh, this is a fabulous chapter. Really excited to be covering it because this chapter is not about the kingdom. This, this chapter takes us... Sorry, I'm just going to move my laptop so I can see it a little better. This chapter is, it's taking us beyond the kingdom. It's taking us out and beyond into the far yonder. In the kingdom, there will still be tears. There will still be death. There will still be sorrow and crying and pain for some. There will still be people who don't trust God. There will still be unbelievers. There'll be the abominable. That's what it said in verse 8. They'll still be there. But in this chapter, all of those things, all of those types of people and those attitudes become no more. The second resurrection will be passed. The second death will have been done. And then we're out in the beyond. Out past the last signposts. This chapter isn't set in the aeon. It's not set in the millennium. It's set in what the Hebrew describes as the ad, the, the forever beyond, out beyond all that we know. There are four chapters in the Bible that, that talk about this time explicitly. There's Revelation 21, this chapter, and Revelation 22, they're paired. It's 1 Corinthians 15, which we'll look at in a bit, and also 2 Corinthians 12. But only in this chapter do we get any more than just the smallest, most cursory detail. Finally, here at the end of the book of Christ himself, he opens up and he, he gives us more detail 
about what happens next, and it's so exciting. And so the promise of our chapter this, this evening is we're going to be looking at the holy city. Verse 27, there shall no wise enter into it anything that defiles. There won't be anything that makes abominable. There won't be any lies. There are no shadows in this city. What is in the city? Only those written in the Lamb's book of life. It's truly a holy city. That's what it says in verse 2. A holy city. It is the only holy city that has ever been. Every other city has had individuals who walked through it, who were less than holy, had less than holy thoughts. But this one, not a single person in it harbors any thought that is anything less than divine. And in this chapter, finally, God will wipe away all tears. Verse 4. Actually, that would be better written. God will wipe away every tear. And you might think, well, what's the difference? Why, why would you make a semantic difference like that? Every, every single version of the Bible I looked at in preparation for, to, for tonight, Amplified Version, American Standard, English Standard, NET, Rotherham's, RV, Weymouth, Young's Literal, all of them say every tear. And the reason is it's much more tender. The Greek is showing us a tender and personal interaction. This is, this is not the bulk removal of tears of, uh, from all humanity. God is not doing sort of control out, delete on every tear on the planet, click and they're all magically gone. No, this is a tender interaction between father and child as God, not Christ, God wipes away every last tear. Not all tears, every tear. And if you should shed just one more tear, it's almost as if the text is saying he will be there. He'll be there in a moment to wipe that tear away too. Till they're all gone. And this is a chapter, it's a chapter full of negatives. Uh, put this picture up because I, I'm using, as I've told you, I'm using this uh, AI to generate my images and I, I told it to generate me an image that said no more ne an image of no more negatives and that's what it came up with and I thought that'll do. Um, I, I have to tell you this before we get a bit deeper and a bit more serious tonight. Uh, you won't believe what it came up uh, with when I said I want an image of a great white throne. A great white throne. There was a big shark on that throne. It was very strange. Um, so anyway, sorry, complete digression. Back to our subject. This is a subject full of, a, a chapter full of negatives. Because in this chapter, by the end of it, there's no sea. There's no tears. There's no death anywhere. And he goes on to say, in, in the end of verse 4, that there'll be no mourning. Trench says, mourning is that grief that so takes possession of the whole being that it cannot be hid. That'll be gone. That sort of sorrow. It's translated wailing elsewhere. No more of that. No more crying. Crying is that loud outcry, which is the witness that the times are out of joint. But these times, they're not out of joint. Everything seems to work in this era. There's no reason to cry that everything's topsy-turvy now because it's not. And there's no pain. Labor, travail, weariness. That's what was introduced. In the fall, God spoke to the woman and said, there'll be pain. He spoke to Adam and said, there'll be weariness, sweat of your brow, sorrow, frustration, gone. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to think about. And so John starts off, he says in verse 2, I, John, 
I, John, saw this. I saw it. He's emphatic. And this is, this is rare, rare. As you go through the book of Revelation, John's not all the way going, I, John, saw this. I, John, saw that. Now, usually he just says, I saw this. I did that. I was in the spirit and I wrote and the angel said, there's only three places where he says, I, John. And, and the first one's in Revelation chapter 1. Second one's our chapter tonight. Third one, Revelation 22. And, and so obviously what John is saying here, he feels strongly about. He feels differently about this section to others. It's exceptional for him to talk this way. He's not content with just saying, I saw. Almost, it almost seems initially that he wants to remind us and perhaps himself that yeah, it was me. I, I was the one that saw that. Yeah, really. Me. And perhaps he's, he's saying that I'm part of these events. I'm, I'm woven into this story. I, John, really get to be there and see these things. But I want you to notice the way this phrase, I, John, is used in the first time it's used. Hopefully most of you can read that. What do we think the subtext is there? Why does he say, I, John? What, what's he trying to tell us? If you read the rest of that verse, what, what's the I, John, do in that sentence? What's its function? you think he was maybe incredulous? Me. <laughs> Who would have thought I would end up on Patmos? Of all people, the last person you'd think would end up on Patmos. I, John, was on Patmos. Is that it? Or maybe he's boastful. Seems unlikely, but could be, right? I, John Esquire, son of the great Boanerges and senior brother at Ephesus, I survived Patmos. I have the t-shirt. Others didn't, but I was there. I, John. That's not right either, is it? I think this is intended to be reassuring. The things I'm about to record are... Well, if I hadn't seen them myself... I wouldn't believe them, but brothers and sisters, you know me, you know John, me, your brother. I suffered alongside with you. Every step of the way I was there, and now I'm on Patmos. So, so I know this stuff is unbelievable, but please believe me. And I, I think that's what this is. I think it's an appeal to his credibility. And so it's the same in our chapter. This chapter tonight is so unbelievable. So beyond the pale of any comprehension, anything you read anywhere else in the Bible. And he has to say, look, just, just trust me. This is really John speaking to you. you. You know me. I'm a straight shooter. I wouldn't lie. He's speaking to a suffering ecclesia and he says, please trust me. This is coming. And it's worth the wait. And so we're told in the first verse that a new heavens, I saw a new heavens and a new earth. And that would be better expressed, a former heavens and earth. The, the word um, really sort of serves to, to just sort of be relative and tells, tell us it was, it was earlier. Not necessarily the paramount, but the previous. I saw a great white throne we're told in chapter 20 and him that sat on it from whose face the heaven and earth fled away so in the chapter we considered last time the heaven and earth fled away then or at least a heaven and earth fled away and here we've got a new heaven and earth because the first, pardon me, the first, I'm being confusing my words here, the first heaven and earth are gone. The former heaven and earth are gone. So let me clarify the confusing words I've just said. In the book of Revelation, in the Bible, we should consider there to be three heavens and earths. Three. And they represent three epochs of time. 
three great swaths of time. The first, heaven and earth, is that period we live in, where the, the wicked are like a troubled sea. Luke is told that, that before Christ comes, the world will be like the sea and the waves are roaring. And so the first heaven and earth is characterized by having a stormy, troubled sea. The one that is here referred to as the first or the former heaven and sea that has passed away, that's a different heaven and sea. You see, that heaven and sea shows up first earlier in Revelations, in, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, where it says, and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. So in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, we've stepped into the kingdom age. Christ has come, the saints have been revealed, and the sea, previously troubled, turbulent, angry, is now like a sea of glass. So era one, first heaven and earth, original heaven and earth, if you like, original system of the world, if you want to view it that way, has a troubled sea. Second heaven and earth, here called the first, but we'll say the former, just to be clearer, the former heaven and earth, former to the last, has a glassy sea. And then there's the last one. It's the one in this chapter. And you see what it says? No more sea. The sea's gone. So we've got three eras of time. The first one, before the millennium, troubled sea. The second one, during the millennium, the nation's like a sea of glass. The third one, no sea. And we're really dealing with that third era tonight, the era of no sea. No, it's not that the sea is not turbulent. It's that there is no more system that could ever war with God, that could ever rage, could ever be stormy. It's gone. It's not just like glass. It's gone. Here's what Corinthians says. The apostle said in 2 Corinthians 12, it's not expedient for me to doubtless glory. I'm not going to boast about all of the things I've done, all of the achievements I've had in my life. I'm going to come to visions. I want to tell you about visions and revelations of the Lord. And here we believe that Paul is probably trying to be humble and not reveal that he was the one who had this vision. But nonetheless, he says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body... I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one was caught up to the third heaven. I knew this man. Can't tell you if it was in the body or out of the body. God knows. He was caught up to paradise. And he heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for man to utter. And Paul couldn't tell us these words, but John does tonight. He tells us what that time looks like. Paul went there for a moment to encourage him, to strengthen him, we believe. That third era with no sea. But he couldn't tell anyone about it. And here, Christ gives it to John and John gives it to us. We'll come back to, to 1 of Corinthians. 1 of Corinthians chapter 15. Here's the other place that talks, I think, about this era, the third heaven era. 1 of Corinthians chapter 23 to 28 where he says speaking of how we are made alive how we were raised he says every man will be raised in his own order Christ first the first fruits afterwards they that are Christ that is coming That's the resurrection of the dead that we await now. Then comes the end. So sometime later, then comes the end, when he, that is Jesus, shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. This is the point.
point when he, that is Jesus, will have put down all rule and all authority and all power. Because Jesus must reign till God has put all enemies under Jesus' feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. When does that happen? Well, that happens at the end of the millennium. That happens in Revelation chapter 20 and 21. The chapters we're looking at. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For God has put all things under Jesus' feet. But when God says all things are put under Jesus, it is manifested that God is accepted, which did put all things under Jesus. And when all things shall be subdued unto Jesus, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto God that put all things under Jesus, that God may be all in all. Now, I substituted words in here to try and make it clear what's going on in this passage. But he's talking about the time beyond the millennium when Jesus gives back the kingdom to God because God will now reign in his own right. God will be all in all. And that, that there is the third heaven. And so it's got no sea. There's no sea. Here's what the Old Testament said about that. Jeremiah, I'm with you, Israel, says God, to save you. Though I make a full, of all na- a full end of all nations, I won't make a full end of you. In fact, he goes one step stronger. I will make a full end of all nations. The nations that are like a miry sea will be finished, says Jeremiah 46. There will be no more. Or Daniel chapter 2. The iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold. All the nations broken pieces into pieces together. And in that time, the mountain will fill the whole earth, excluding any nation. So back to Revelation 22. Now, there's so much in this chapter, and I cannot possibly cover everything in this chapter. So we're going to be... Uh, skipping some things so if there's a particular thing that you really like and I miss it I apologize come and come and tell me off over supper and I'll see if I can fit it into the next class so John in verse 2 saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband So the city that we're going to see in this chapter will be described in the most beautiful of Old Testament terms. He's going to use these these incredible terms, but they are also in some ways vague and in specific. He's not giving us specific detail here. He's giving us a a high-level picture of what the beyond looks like. We're We're not going to be able to answer any real questions out of this chapter you know where do we live what will we be doing where will we be going will we meet God face to face these are questions that are impossible to answer from this chapter he's not giving us that detail he's giving us a general picture using beautiful threads woven and stripped out of the old testament to make a new tapestry as it were and that's deliberate. It's deliberate that it's a bit blurry. And that's because, as, as Paul said, the things we're talking about are too wonderful so that it's not lawful to describe them. But here he's, he's describing the bride, the ecclesia, all the ecclesia, all through history, all through time, united in one image, if you like, one picture. Because now at this point they are all the sons of God that will ever be from this history are here. Oh, on the day the kingdom starts and the temple is opened, most of the bride of Christ are there. But what what about the ones that are born in the millennium that God is still looking for, that knows must come and is calling? They are missing. But now at this point, the bride is finally complete. All of them united as one. 
all sons and daughters of the living God. And yet, as we'll see, even though united, each one is, is very unique. We'll come to that in a minute. And so John hears this great voice out of heaven. Probably it should say out of the throne. The, the, he, the Greek here is slightly unclear about exactly what's being pointed at. So here's this, this voice out of the throne. And you think, well, I wonder who that voice is. Well, verse 3 goes on to tell us. Behold, says the voice, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. God himself shall be with them. God with them. God with them. See, the voice speaks, and, and it says... The tent of God is with mankind. God dwells with mankind. All mankind are God's people. God himself is with mankind. God is mankind's God. God is with them. God is with them. So, so who's the tent of God that dwells with man? Who is this, this tent that he's talking about? Because it's symbolic, isn't it? We know. A virgin shall conceive. You have a name. God with us. God with us. And, and we know who speaks out of the throne. Revelation 5 verse 6 tells us it's the lamb. The lamb that had been slain is the one that speaks out of the throne. Revelation 7, for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. And here that same lamb, Jesus Christ, is speaking to them. And he says, speaking out of the throne, I, the tent of God, the meeting place of God, will be with you. Emmanuel, God with you. I am with you. And yet, verse 4, and God wipes away all tears. God does. Because you see, just as we have become a part of the uncountable bride by this point in time, so he too, Jesus Christ, has become God. God is all in him. And he is God not in a Trinitarian way. That's not what we're saying. This is all about the symbology. But, but here in this chapter, there is this unity of God and Son, just the same as there is the unity of, of the bride and the individuals within the bride. Look at verse 22. He says, I saw no temple there, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Two individuals, one temple. Because they're united. God and Jesus become indistinguishable in many ways at this point. Oh yes, two distinct individuals, but one meeting place. Just as we, though unique and distinct, are indistinguishable from the bride. And so he says, verse 5, Behold, I make all things new. And we're left with the question in the English. Is he making all new things? Or is he making all things new? There's two key words for the word new in the New Testament. There's neos and kainos. Neos means new in time. Kainos means new in nature. Brand new. Novel, different. Well, the word here is kainos. Different in nature. You see, God is making all new things. This is not about a refreshing of the old world. It's not just the new model, Earth 2.0 or 3.0. That's not what this is. God's saying, I'm making everything brand new. The millennium, the millennium's just, just a twist on the old world. Peace, Christ is king. But this, this is completely different. It's a different, a radically new and different heavens and earth. The universe is changed, as it were. And, and brothers and sisters, don't we need this? I don't know about you, but 
To me, this world feels so old and broken. All creation groans, says Romans. And yes, I guess in a sense, God can put the planet up on the hoist and send it round for another thousand years. But he says, no, that, that, that's, that's, that's the band-aid. I make all things new. Now, young people, don't get confused. We're not saying here that what God is going to do is destroy the planet physically and make a brand new planet. Although he could if he wanted to. But it's talking about the system of things, the way things work. And God is saying, the time beyond the millennium won't be similar to the millennium. It's completely different. As if the whole world were made fresh from the atoms up. And so Jesus says to John, write these words. They're true and faithful. Believe me, John. This is what you've come here for. This is why you've endured through 20 chapters of this depressing book about wars and about violence, about vials and trumps. You endured it. Trumpets, should I say. You endured for all that time to get here and I, Jesus, the faithful and true, the verily, verily, I say unto you, that one says, trust me. And then he says, it's done. It's finished. I've done it. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I'll give unto him that is a thirst, the fountain of the water of life freely. You know, that, that phrase about the fountain of the water of life only occurs in one story in the Bible outside Revelation. It's the story of the woman at the well of Samaria. Give me of this water. If you had this water, you'd never need to drink ever again in all of history. And then he says, and this is the appeal to all the believers down through time. If you can overcome, you'll inherit all things. I'll be your God. You'll be my son. You know, that phrase overcometh, that word, is connected to a Hebrew word. We know that because it's used by Paul, and Paul is quoting a Hebrew passage. And here's the, the passage that Paul quotes. He quotes this. And we've been there tonight, 1st of Corinthians 15. At the end of 1st Corinthians 15, Paul says, he that, he that is God will swallow up death in victory. That's our word here, overcometh. And the Lord will wipe away all tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people will take away from off all the earth. For Yahweh has spoken it. The verily and the true. The faithful and the true. And that's our context. That's right where we are, isn't it? That's the right passage. And Isaiah was told that he will swallow up death in victory. He that hath victory over death will inherit all things. God will remove all tears, all rebuke. But speaking of rebuke, verse 8. All those characteristics of fear, cowardice and unbelief, shameful activities, they will be finished. The second death, the death at the end of the millennium, will terminate those behaviours forever. And then, and then, in a moment... John's friend re-emerges, the angel, one of the angels with the vial. But this angel has talked to him a number of times before. We've met him several times before, this angel with the vial. Perhaps the sixth angel who heralds in the battle of Armageddon. Who knows, but this old friend carries John away in the spirit. And he carries him away to show him the bride, the lamb's wife. And up they go, up, up, up into a high mountain. And, 
And if John had been writing text as he was flying in the spirit with the, the angel, he would have noticed something. He would have noticed as he, as he flew up into the high mountain, he would have thought, oh, what? I, I, mm, I remember this. The spirit taking someone up into a high mountain. That's Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 40. The beginning of the, the, the prophecy of Ezekiel's temple. And, and again and again, we're going to see in this chapter, we're not going to go through it, but they're up on the screen, that Ezekiel's temple is paralleled with this temple. There's a great or very high mountain in both pictures. There's a great city, the great frame of a city in both pictures. There's a wall around the city in both pictures. There are gates in both pictures. There are 12 tribes in both pictures. But most importantly, both are measured by reeds, and reeds are not used for measurement anywhere else in the Bible. Only in these two stories, as if to say, don't miss it. These two are stitched together because one... One is the foundation of the other. And amazingly, even though we look at Ezekiel's temple as being way off in the future, that actually just happens to be the old shadowy foundation for the temple we're looking at right now, for the city we're looking at tonight. So he carried him away, and down comes the city. It's got the glory of God. We'll come to that later on. Her light, the city is just shining with light. And it's got a great wall and it's got 12 gates and 12 angels. And we're going to go on and find out that it's got 12 foundation stones, 12 great foundation stones. Verse, verse 18, the building of the wall of it was like Jasper. Verse 19, the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. And then he gives us this list of these stones. These are vast carved gemstones that serve as the foundations. Now, I, I spend a bit of time working on these foundations. Yeah, great. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Uncle Greg. Great, great save. That should be Revelation 21 all the way down there, not 22. That'll confuse everyone. Thank you. So, the foundation stones. So, I am... Um, I tried a variety of ways messing around with different 3D tools to try and map out how these stones went. Now the foundations, we're told in verse 16, are going to be four square. The city lies four square. And, and John has to be able to see all of the stones of the foundation to be able to describe them. So. You can't have one stone in the middle underneath the whole building where you can't see it. You've got to have them all visible. So that, that was my first iteration of what I came up with. Twelve stones. You've got to have twelve stones. and That kind of worked. But you know what? There is another way to line up the twelve stones to meet the criteria of being four square, all the stones visible, twelve stones. So here's the other arrangement, like this. As far as I can see, that, that's the only other way you could lay out 12 stones and, and still have all of them visible from the outside and have it four square. So that one, does, does that remind you of anything? Good, Aunty Rosemary's nodding. That means that the most brilliant in the room have got it, but I'll explain it to all the rest of you that and see we've just been told in verse 12 it's got a great wall and high it's got 12 gates at the gates stand 12 angels and the names are written on the gates the gates are named after the 12 tribes not the stones the stones are actually named after the apostles but but just before we go there anything else that we think of when we think of all of these Gemstones lined up for square? Thank you, Esther. Right on the money. She's saying very clearly the breastplate of the high priest. But you see, that's a different layout. But, but I think maybe, just maybe, here's a thought for tonight. We've got that layout wrong. See, Exodus describes four rows of three stones. 
But the word road as service for walls, for walls of three stones is a possibility as well. And, and by the way, the chapter in Exodus that describes the breastplate says that they have to be also laid out four square and says they must be laid out like the tribes of Israel. Which to me would suggest that maybe the breastplate of the high priest was a bit more like this. And maybe the stones corresponded with their camping positions in the wilderness. And so here's, here's our foundations. Now, I haven't coloured them. I'm sorry about that. Ran out of time. But on top of these foundations, there's 12 gates. And, and the gates have the tribe's names, not the stones. The foundations have got the names of the apostles. Can, can you see what's happened there? Foundations, apostles, then gates, tribes. You see, here, at, at the base of this city, is old and new. Old Testament and New Testament united in the base of this great and glorious city. Right there at the bottom where people come in and out, they step up over the foundation of the apostles, through the gate of the history of Israel, the tribes of Israel. And we're told in verse 16 that the city lies four square. The length of it is large as the breadth of it. Well, that's what four square means, right? But also, he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length, the breadth, the height are equal. Oh, so this is a very strange city. Length, breadth, and height equal. That happens elsewhere in the Bible, doesn't it? In, in the temple, Solomon's temple, the oracle, the, the holy of holies, the place where God met with mankind. I will be your God. I will dwell with you. The very place where God dwelt with the nation was the same high as it was broad as it was deep. A tube of a building inside another rectangular building. The most holy was a cube. And so the dimensions of this city in some ways mirror the holy of holies in the temple. Because this whole city is the holy of holies. And everyone who lives in it is in the dwelling place of God, is right with God where he is. And so you can see, we've got here, in, in these pictures of stones and of gates, of foundations, of measurements. There's the Temple of Solomon, together with the camp in the wilderness, together with the breastplate of the high priest, together with the Temple of Ezekiel, all merged now into this one glorious image, all of them layered over the top of each other because the meeting place of God is with man. The men who meet with God the mediator and the mediated all merge at this one point in history. And he says, it's 12 stadia. Sorry, 12,000 stadia. He measures it. Now that word furlongs is, is a Roman term. I don't know why he uses a Roman term, but it's stadia, or actually Greek. Um, stadia. And, and it's a measurement. We don't know precisely how long it is. It's a bit like the cubit. But in this case, it ranges from somewhere between uh, five, 150 metres long to 209 metres long. Someone did a huge exercise when they, where they got all of the distances in a couple of the ancient historians that were measured by stadia, and then they averaged out the real distance by measuring how far it was between those places themselves, and they came to a stadia being about 157 metres on average. So that works out at 1,884 kilometres on one side by 1,884 kilometres on another side by 1,884 kilometres high. So just, just for funsies, I'll put that on a map. That's quite a big metropolitan area, isn't it? Eh? Quite large. Look, just for really funsies, I went one step further. You can tell how silly I was feeling last night by this. Here we go. Just, just so you can see. That's how big it would be. 
That's how big it would be relative to the earth. And of course it's not literal, is it, brothers and sisters? That's nonsense. He's not saying he's going to build a city that's 1,800 kilometers tall. He's drawing a picture, a wonderful picture. This isn't meant to be taught, taken literally. Instead, he's saying, yeah. Um, yeah, I just noticed that in Revelation 21, there's no mention of the Lord Jesus. So when he mentioned the Yes. Yeah. Because wood is, is temporary. But everything here is enduring. And also, I might add, very strange. Giant pearls big enough to make gates of. Jasper that is transparent like a sapphire. Gold that is see-through. Everything is strange and yet wonderful. And here we've got this city, this vast city, 12,000 by 12,000 by 12,000. Oops. 144,000 saints is the number that the Bible gives us. Now, it's not, again, young people, not a literal number. There will not be exactly 144,000 saints. It's a representative number describing a great big number of saints. And it just happens to be 12,000 times 12,000. 144,000. And yet now, even though we started with 12,000 times 12,000 to get 144,000. Now, we multiply it again by another 12,000. Almost as if each of the tribes had each brought forth a thousandfold. Each of the apostles a thousandfold. 144,000 descendants and each has their space. And he says he measures the city. The one that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city. The city lies so long, and he says in verse 17, he measured the wall, 144 cubits. There's that number. According to the measure of man, that is the measure of an angel. The measure of a man, that is an angel. What's that about? He is... So, so in the picture, we've got this man, and he's, he's got a long rod called a reed, used for measuring stuff. Well, maybe we'd say a, a meter ruler, but his is gold. It's really special. Because it's for measuring special things. But we're told that this measuring system he's using to measure the wall in the city, it's... It's the measure of a man, which is the measure of an angel. Might be better to read it this way. We don't need the commas. The measure of a man, that is an angel. Because this this is a man. The man with the golden reed is, is the son of man. And the measure of the city is the measure of him. He's, he's, in a sense, measuring himself. Remember, he was the chief cornerstone. And, and this city is a multiple of him. There was him, and then there were 143,000 others measured from his perfect block. And, and he is the one who is the messenger of God, the measure of us all. The first stone. Have a look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. I promise this is the last quote will turn up tonight, and we're close to the end. Ephesians 4, verse 13. Actually, we'll start a little earlier. This is brilliant. The measure of a man that is an angel. The measure of us, the chief cornerstone. He measures us. He that descended, verse 10, is the same that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Jesus, he went down into the grave, but he also went to heaven to receive for us gifts like apostleships, prophecies, evangelism, pastorship, teaching, 
for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying and the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith. That's, that's this moment. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, a man that is an angel, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The measure, the read, multiples of Christ. And so there's 12 stones. 12 stones in the foundations. I went through, tried to work out what the symbology of those stones were, got completely lost and bamboozled, wasn't even sure which stones were which in the end. But I, I want to show you something really exciting. Something exciting about these stones. And I'm very confident that John could not have known this. You see, those stones, coming back here, you notice in the notes, there's a, there's a phrase there, an isotrophic. Every one of the stones was an isotrophic. Now, you might say, big deal, what's that mean? Well, lots of, lots of gemstones are an isotrophic. It's not actually super rare. But it, it's an interesting property because it turns out that you can use an, an isotropy to work out whether the stone is a stone, whether this is a fake or a real one. Because what you do is you get ideally a laser, you shine it through a polarizer. That means you've only got light in one plane for those of you who like your physics. And then you cross polarize it. So you shine it through another polarizer to make sure that you've got cross-polarized light. It is very, very straight up and down light. And then you shine it into the stone. And when you shine the stone, this is what it looks like. These are what the different stones look like. Under cross-polarized light, they, they sparkle with a thousand colors within them, all of them. Now, some of these stones, when you look at them, they don't sparkle normally. Maybe an emerald does, but Crystallite, peridot, it, it's sort of a murky yellow stone apparently. Amethyst is purple, but it's not sparkly with lots of colours. Chrysoprasus, sardius, sardius is a red stone, but it's kind of opaque. But when you shine this cross-polarised light into it, it looks like that. And you think, well, what's, what's the big deal about that? Well, here's some other stones that could have been there. Diamond, we'd have chosen diamond, wouldn't we? Diamond would be definitely one of them. Put it on, if you're going to put it on her finger, probably, a, you know, it's the most precious one. Let's make one of the foundation stones diamond. But that's what those stones look like under the same light. They're not anisotropic. And there are lots of other stones that aren't anisotropic, but every single one he selected was. Every single one. And, and where does that light come from? Well, back in Revelation chapter 21... We saw this. Revelation chapter 21. I saw no temple there, verse 22. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb of the temple and the city has no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine on it, for the, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb of God is the light thereof. God and the Lamb lighten it. They're cross polarized light and when God's light shines on these human stones they glisten with a thousand colors but put the science to, to a side for one minute what are we looking at well we're effectively saying there is a rainbow of stones around the base of the temple that shine with all of the colors because even though at this point we are all one in Christ Jesus and in God, the colours merge to be white. That unity doesn't mean monotony. Every one of us will be different and sparkle with our own light when lit by the glory of God. It's wonderful. And so he says there'll be no more temple there. 
The Lord, the, the master of Old Testament meaning, is in this chapter, he's pulling passages together from so many Old Testament references. It's a bit dizzying. There's Jerusalem built new. There's 12 gates for 12 tribes. There's 12 huge foundation stones laid like the breastplate of the high priest, yet representing 12 apostles. The city's a perfect cube. Each 12th side is 12,000 stadia, but there's no temple. Because God is no longer limited to the oracle or even to the temple. No, God fills the whole earth now. Which brings us back to the beginning. No more sea. And hopefully as you read these verses now, you read them a little different. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. It's different. The sea is replaced. They did cover the sea, but now the earth, the seas are filled with the glory of God. And so, take home point for tonight. This city is a she. It's described as her. Every Bible agrees. The Greek agrees. It's a she. This female city, the great city of the beyond, she's lit by the glory of God. It's God's glory. It's God's character that, that brightens every corner, leaves no shadow, no darkness, no hidden thing nor hidden place. The Greek there says that God, God's light, and he uses the word phos, which means underived light, light that emanates from within, without control, like the sun. And then it says, and the lamb's light, and the word there is a portable torch, a, a, a lamp brought into a space. They're both there, and they shine. And, and our takeaway, takeaway point is this, that God's glory doesn't just shine in her, shines out of her. She's crystal. The light is within her. She's like a, a city on a hill with no walls that can be seen because they're all glass. And this blazing light filling the whole world. And the point is, if we want to be part of the bride of Christ for all of the rest of history then we've got to be the people who God's glory shines out of now God bless Thanks for that, Dan. I think um, every now and then you watch a movie or read a book or something and you finish it and you just go, I just need to sit back and process that because I'm trying to wrap my head around it. I think that for me was one of those talks. I just need to have nothing on in the car on the way home and just let my br try and wrap my brain around what I've just been taught <laughs> or been shown. <clears throat> uh, Okay, so um, a couple of announcements. I'm probably going to get in trouble after the um, meeting because I forgot to mention that. We've got this little cafe set up thing in the corner where um, if you wanted a coffee throughout the night, you could go and grab one or a cup of tea. There's even some biscuits up there. Um, so take that as an announcement for next week that uh, there'll be a cafe up in the corner that uh, you can grab a coffee or a tea or a biscuit if you want at any time through the course of the study or get, a bit, get here a bit earlier. Um, for the same. Um, next Wednesday uh, we are kicking off, I think it's a two-part series by Dane, Brother Dane Linden um, on the, it's titled Who Am I? Uh, and the, the, the series is titled Who Am I? Sorry, and the title next week is Community and the Holy Spirit. And uh, there are a couple of people here, so um, Chris Carter's on chair. Megan Carmody on the piano, Axel is Dorman, and Supper is Ray Carter and Fiona Manzava. 
So let's close our meeting now. Um, and our hymn is correct up on the board. Uh, that will be hymn 105. Father in heaven, we close our meeting now, thanking you for the opportunity that we've had to be here tonight and, and for the incredible layers and detail that you've given us to unravel in order to understand uh, the future that you have for us in this book of Revelation. While it's perplexing on a surface level, as we dig down through history and through the layers of biblical references and teachings, we find a wealth of gold, a treasure chest, as it were, of information and knowledge. And thank you for what we have, because it's not only encouraging of what we have to hope for, but this detail and the accuracy and the consistency of it is encouraging in itself as well. So we, uh, we close our meeting also, thank you for the food and the drink that you give us each day. And remember for you for these simple provisions that we receive. Through your son Jesus Christ we offer our prayer. Amen. <coughs>